Oh, it's nice to see some people here. The last day of the conference, um, I think I'll, there's a lot of people went home already, but uh, okay. I'm James Hunt from ICAS, and I'm going to be talking about uh, um, data collection uh, in the in from vehicles. And of course, because it's an open source conference, I'm going to also talk about the you know the technology we use and how we've you know adapted it for for this uh, application domain. So uh, we've been doing this for a while now, um, probably around 10 years. So we have more than uh, 25 million vehicles in the field. Um, so we have some real uh, experience in how, how to do this and, and what's important and what's, uh, what's not important. So, um, so we're using OSGI as a basis for this, but also based on a real-time um, Java system. And uh, um, some of the things we're worried about is not just getting all the data from the from the vehicle. That's way too inefficient and way way too costly. So conditional delivery, um, being able to synthesize signals on on the de on the device. Um, doing format conversion, all the things that you want to do so you get consistent data uh, from your vehicles because the way that data is done, expressed in the vehicle is not even standard within a um, manufacturer across their vehicle lines. So, so these are important parts of, of trying to get it done. So the advantage of, of having this kind of system is you can get more information with less data and you can change the way the, the data is, is collected on the fly. So if you have a particular problem with, with, with a set of vehicles, you can get more information pertaining just to that problem. Or if you need to, uh, you know, if you have a fleet management system, you very easily tailor the, the data that's being collected for, the, for what needs to be done um, in the fleet. So the reason why we use uh, OSGI is it gives us a couple of advantages. Uh, one is we have very small modules. I mean, people talk about Kubernetes and Docker and things as being microservices. Those are huge compared to what we can do in terms of applications, uh, which means that we can fit on a, on a much smaller ECU than a system based on, on, on Docker. Um, we have lifecycle management, we have ro remote control, we can see into the vehicle, we know it's running, we can change it, we can update it, all from a secure, over a se secure connection that the vehicle sets up to the cloud, not the other way around. Because we have this infra infrastructure and platform on the, uh, on the, on the, you know, on the vehicle. So, um, There are some global regu regulations coming along. I think we heard that this morning at the talk, um, where we have to worry about not just uh, um, that the data that we're sending is secure, but the software that's on the vehicle um, has a known providence. And OSGI gives us features to do this. It also makes it, makes it very easy for the, the platform to know that the software that's, that it starts up, that it got from the cloud, is from a known source because everything that we send down to the, the vehicle in terms of software is encrypted with keys that are known so that we can, we can verify where it came from so we can do the software providence and we can in ensure that that piece of software only has the rights into the vehicle that that piece of software should have, okay? So um, this is not uh, um, without without you know, we we had to modify the system because a, a traditional Java implementation is not really designed for for OT applications. It's designed for for you know cloud applications where you have no concern of, over timing for your system. If you're doing real time data collection, uh, the timing of the bus makes a big difference. And if you can't keep up with it, then you can't get the job done. So. Um, there's there's a number of things in a real in a normal Java that make this uh, this difficult. One is garbage collection, because uh, most of the the cloud most of the Java garbage collectors 
will stop the whole system for some period of time at some point. So usually you're very fast and suddenly, some, so suddenly you're not. Just-in-time compilation is also an issue um, because you start out slow and then you get slowly fast, but during that compilation time, you're even slower than the interpreter for some period of time. So that's, that's an issue. Then scheduling is an issue because in Java, the scheduling is not defined. Um, what, is, what is priority one, two, three, four? You know, people expect that you have a low priority task that it still makes progress. Well, that's because there's a sort of this assumption that there's a fair schedule behind it. But for real-time tasks, you need, uh, need real-time scheduling. And uh, not only do you need real-time scheduling, uh, but if you have real-time scheduling, it's very easy to lock up the whole system. So you need something to, to manage your resources so that won't happen with, with code that you, you load dynamically. So um, to address some of this, um, these issues, we use uh, something called the real-time specification for Java, which provides the features that we need um, to do real-time programming. One is a deterministic garbage collector, um, but there's also things like uh, different ways of talking about uh, code. Instead of writing a loop for an event, you can d define an event handler, so when something happens, uh, you run that piece of code. So it makes your analysis much, m much simpler. Um, and that event can be a timing event. So if I want to do it, something every 10 milliseconds, I set up a timer that says 10 milliseconds, you know, run this piece of code. And that makes my whole worst case execution time analysis a lot simple because I only need to, need, need to look at that code. I don't need to, to try to discover where the, the loop starts and ends in terms of a timing situation. Um, then we have a ahead of time compilation so that we can compile the, the, uh, the code before we deploy it. Well, what happens with downloaded code? Well, we also have a way to compile the code in a jar file provide an SO, SO for it and link that at runtime. So we can download code even if it wasn't in the initial image. So we can put the base, base platform things in the in initial image and then run, uh, run from there. And of course, the operating systems you support are different. Not everything is Linux, not everything is Windows, you know. There's, there, there are other uh, operating systems used in these environments. So just a, it's a short overview of what the differences are. Um, conventional Java provides the base language, so we, we stick to that, that language so you can use code that, that's uh, been designed in other places, but you can still get these, these real-time advantages. And that's a good mix, uh, particularly for mixed critical systems where part of your system is real-time, the other part of the system is really cloud-oriented and you want to use the same kind of APIs and things there. So then there's the challenge for, for OSGI. OSGI has to be adapted to this, and, and like I said before, you know, without some resource enforcement, without being able to say this particular code should only use a certain part of uh, the memory and CPU, I have a system that's easy to lock up. But if I add these facilities, it's very easy to, to manage downloaded code because I can even ask it, okay, what are your requirements? Do I have enough uh, CPU available to fill it or not? And, uh, you know, adding these things uh, are, can be done d directly based on, on the facilities that the real-time specification for Java brings. Okay, that's the technology. Now I'm going to get into the more the, the aspects of data collection. Okay, and there, there's different, different levels. One is, you know, you need to know what, what signals you want to get, how, how to define them. You need to be the system should have some self-awareness so that a management system knows what vehicles it's talking to and what kind of capabilities those vehicles have. Because again, you think of having vehicles over in the field over 10, 20 years, those vehicles, the newer ones, will be different than the old ones. They'll be able to do different things than the old ones. But still, you want an, a uniform platform and a platform that you can update in the field. So one of the things we can do is and we've been doing is updating the software in the field. So as the data collection application evolves, we can, we can change that even for vehicles that uh, have already been deployed. Uh, 
transmission is an issue, you know, again, don't want to send everything. You want a compact format for sending that data. You know, just sending big JSON things is probably not the best way to do it, you know, uh, just because of uh, the variations in, in connectivity that an, uh, a car would have. You need to be able to store and forward things. You need to be able to decide, oh, now I'm at home, I have a Wi-Fi connection, I can do a big data dump, or no, I'm riding, I'm somewhere in the hills and, and I only have G2 connection and and, you know, I really want to send the, the, the minimum data, you know. So you also want to be able to design a data acquisition plans that enable you to, to manage this sort of thing and uh, enable to, you to manage to, uh, the things that are very available. <coughs> so, again, th we need to do this dynamically. I mean, there are, there are, there are people out there like... Uh, uh, Fleetwise from AWS, which they have some kind of data adaption plan. Well, what they're doing actually came from the work we did with our customer beforehand. Um, and it's really relatively simple. You have a, a, a little interpreter language and based on some simple things, you can collect data. That's nice, but that's just the beginning because if you want to do something more complicated, like have a model of your ba battery on the, on the vehicle and only send up messages when you deviate from that model, for instance, that kind of system won't work. And these new, new, these new kinds of uh, business models or new ways of doing things are hard to do this. And it, we're talking about AI and wanting to put AI on the platform. Well, if you have the right kind of platform, it's a lot easier to do that than if you have a, a platform that's just <laughs> written in stone. So the general data acquisition looks, this is a very, uh, very simple view, but there's, you know, two sides of it. There's a, a, the vehicle to domain where you actually are interacting with a vehicle bus where you need to, to, to worry about high, high speed uh, data connections in real time. And then you have the data, co the data collector part, which does all the, the, the pre-processing that you want to do with the data before it's sent up and make the decisions about which data to send and when. And these are, you know, in the vehicle, people are worried about security. So we can actually um, give, use different uh, signatures for these, these parts and based off the, those keys, decide which, which, uh, um, which capabilities that software has. So the software on the right-hand side should never be able to talk to the, the, the vehicle bus. The, the software on the left-hand side should never be able to talk to the cloud so that we understand what's going between the vehicle and the cloud. And that's done over a data bus. And because everything is signed before it runs, it's very easy to do this, this kind of thing. So we can really use the trust zone on the vehicle as an anchor of trust that we extend to the software that's, that's dynamically lo loaded onto the system. But that's only part of the system, of course. You have the, the vehicle part in the lower left, left corner, but you also have the, you, you need a cloud part that does several things. One is manage the data collection plans or data acquisition plans. The other is managing additional software that you might want to bring on, on, on the vehicle. And uh, the data collection plans, you don't want to have to have a software uh, developer to, to write those. You want to have a kind of system that makes it easy for somebody who understands at a higher level what they want to do um, and do it easily. So one of the things that we, we do is have tools that we can use in the cloud to, to actually um, design these plans. I mean, these are, these are an example of three simple things. The first is a conditional, um, conditional collection where based on some quantity in the car, in this case, you know, the, the brake and the, and the throttle are on at the same time, only then you send data, okay? Just, and the middle one is a synthesis where we take a data in one form, Oh, no, in, so we, here we take power and RP, uh, torque and RPMs and turn it into power. So if you're just interested in the power that's being applied to the vehicle, you can collect that and, and not the precursors to it. Um, and the third one is just a, a conversion. You have some strange uh, aftermarket thing that you put in the car and you want to use it and get data from it. Well, very 
often you'd want to be able to change the way that works. Of course, these are relatively simple plans. You can do a lot, lot more than this. But the other interesting thing is that you can use the same kind of mechanisms to do data generation, drop it into to you, whatever your, your native uh, I interface is, and use that for simulation. So now, if somebody's sitting at a desk trying to, to um, create such a plan, the first thing they can do is test it against some dummy data and see that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Right, because you compare the inputs and outputs. That's before there's a car at all, that's before there's hardware. And because these things are network-based, it's very easy to merge some. So if I have five different people who want to, want to do things with, with the same fleet or overlapping fleets of vehicles, then I know how to merge them so that I can do my le next level testing before going, going on. Okay, so that's, that's a bit of the technology, but the next thing I wanna talk about is, is, uh, is the business aspects because you know, this doesn't live in a world by itself. There are different roles and responsibilities involved. You don't want somebody just to, to make a data collection plan and send it down all the vehicles without somebody looking over their shoulder and saying, okay, that's been tested well enough that we're confident that, that we can put in our vehicles. Um, there's also data management and of course data privacy is another issue. That I won't uh, won't get very far at, but so here's just a, a example of a rule-based access UIs. There's different people involved that do different things. You have an administrators to to manage users. There are vehicle engineers who would want to add additional signals into the thing into the system. Like if you decide that there's an, an a synthetic signal that everybody wants to use, instead of reprogramming each time you can say, okay, here's a module, use that, it makes it easier for your developers to, to do something. Or, you know, uh, like the, also like the, the model I talked about, having a, a simulation for your battery usage. Those are kinds of things that you want to have a vehicle engineer do. Um, but then you have other people who would might create a fleet or create a campaign to run on a set of, set of cars because you want to know something specific about this set of cars and not the other set of cars. And the point is that all the all these uh, people work in a in a in a in an environment that has initial development, to integration, deployment. This is very similar to do uh, your software, but this is much more dynamic because I'm, doing the, I'm going to do this on cars in the field, so I need to have a, a staged deployment model so that when it gets to the, the field, I'm confident that it's doing the thing that I want it to do. Otherwise, you're wasting a lot of bandwidth and, and putting the, the vehicle at danger. And of course, uh, because there's various people involved, you need a system of deciding who can do what. You need ro roles and responsibilities. These are just examples. Each organization will do it the way they want. But this is an idea of the kind of things that have to go into the system at a, at a meta level, not just in terms of the software that, that goes on the vehicle. Okay, so those are the main points I wanted to bring. Um, of course, data providence is, you know, will be, will be a, a big point in, in, the system, in the future, so you have to build so, uh, software systems that have that in mind. Uh, Real-time uh, Java with OSGS is a powerful base for such systems because, as one of my developers like to say, we give him rubber baby bu buggy bumpers. In other words, he can write software and not have to worry about things like, hey, did I forget to de deallocate that, or did it, you know, what happens if there's an error? Do I get a proper backtrace to see what's going on? And it makes the whole development process a lot quicker, simpler, and easier because a lot of the, the, the bugs you have are caught up early in the system instead of late in the system. Um, vehicles should be self-aware so that if you have thousands of vehicles, or actually millions of vehicles in the field, you can know which software runs in, is, run, is running on each vehicle and what kind of update capabilities you have, what kind of data I can collect, and uh, 
whose vehicles are these so that you can give your, your fleet manager access to some vehicles and others, where are they, things like this. Um, and it's all based on a vehicle knowing where it is and, and what, what kind of vehicle is, what kind of software is in there, what kind of additional things are there like trailers or, or add-ons for um, things like ambulances or fire, fire engines or other speci specialized vehicles. Um, and then roles and responsibilities is, is a essential part of, of such a system so that you have full, full control over who sees what data, why and when. And of course, the process support is essential. So, that's it. So, do I have any questions? There's a gentleman with a microphone phone here. No? Incredibly clear or over your head or, or totally uninteresting? Yeah, you went quite a bit faster about the challenge of data privacy. Yeah. Can you expand there a bit? What, uh, how you are, um, how you are solving that topic? Well, um, there's there's two levels of issues. One is, you know, you have to have the the permission of the vehicle owner uh, to get data out of the car at all. You know, so you want to control first at that level, and that's you know what's knowing knowing what the vehicle is. If it's a vehicle, I'm not allowed to collect. Don't collect. You know? The second is once you get into the cloud, what vehicle, what data can you send where? What processes do you have to anonymize that data if you're using, if you're looking at, at larger things like if I'm the repair organization and an OEM, I may need certain data, but I don't care who's, whose car it is. So I need to have processes in, in the cloud that, that remove some of the information that I may have collected because they need it for other use cases and only send those people that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you have two things, you know, what, what may we collect and that you have to, to organize with the, the vehicle owner and that can change, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's why it needs to be, that's another reason why it needs to be dynamic. If I sell my car to somebody else, I may say, yeah, you can have my data and the other guy will say, mm, no, you know, so you have to be able to change that on the fly. Okay, yeah. Yeah? thanks and great yeah. talk. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so on the topic of simulated synthetic data, which you touched on on this one slide, yeah, um, does a developer have to do all the stuff manually and decide what might be um, realistic data? Or is there any way to put some form of simulated data, ex for example, from a traffic simulator or anything uh, there and yeah. Test with more realistic data, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's uh, certainly also also popular or uh, possible because this whole uh, system is based on a virtual machine. I can run the same virtual machine in the cloud, and I can feed other data into it. Um, sim you know, this is one thing we, we do do. We take uh, previously collected data, we've run it through the system to make sure uh, things are working. So yeah, that's that's. Part of the point. <laughs> okay, thanks. But sometimes it's interesting just to be able to create some signals um, because I don't have all the data I might want, might, might need. And there's some things you can synthesize. If 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 it, you know I, if I want to synthesize data for a vehicle traveling over a certain path, there's certain things that I can calculate and then feed in into the model. So you want to have this multi-faceted way of of doing your testing. All right. Thank you. Great talk. All right, well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.